Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Peter is singing forth, saying, hey, you just got through murdering the Lord Jesus Christ. You crucified him. The same one that brought salvation to the world, the same one that rose from the dead, the same one that took this man that's over 40 years old, lame from the womb itself, and made him jump and leap with joy. He's the one that caused this because he sent the Holy Spirit. And then we completed the last lecture with Psalms 2 being quoted here by um, the uh, apostle. Why do the heathen rage? And look around you today. Why do the heathen rage? Because they don't have the truth. They don't have the Lord. As a matter of fact, we have more people trying to do away with the Word of God than we do hungry for it. But then there are millions that are truly hungry for it. And I am, it is so rewarding to um, have people joining into the truth faster than you can almost keep up. That's, that's a good blessing from Almighty God. So having said that, chapter 4 in this great book of Acts, what are the Acts? It's the way you're supposed to act. You get a bunch of numbskulls that will go off in their own little world. Uh, playing with firecrackers and trying to solve world problems rather than doing it God's way with God's blessings. One way to be successful, do it God's way and be able to still the enemy scalding. And scalding with what you're supposed to with the Word of God. So, uh, Numbskulls are numbskulls, and wise people are wise people. You must always be wiser than the serpent, or he will bite thee. Okay, in chapter 4, verse 26, let's pick it up as the heathen rage, and we, we, which was the last verse we read. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things, empty things, empty-headed bunch of people? Verse 26, the kings of the earth stood up with that word of knowledge from Almighty God. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They were against everything, just againers. 27. And for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, servant Jesus, better translated, whom thou hast anointed. That's what Christ, that's what the word Christ means, is anointed. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. Pilate wanted to let him go. But oh no, the Kenites had to scream out, crucify him, and put the heathen in an upray, uh, at a roar. 28. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, our Father's in control. It was written in Psalms 22 when Christ would say from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God never forsook his son. How could, this, how could Emmanuel, God with us, forsake himself? He was quoting Psalms 22, which would even go down to the words the chief priest was saying in that audience and down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing. That's a thousand years before the fact. Do you think man could pull that off? No way. But our Father can. Predetermined. I don't know, where are you in this plan? Do you know? If you don't, I can guarantee you one thing. You've never covered God's Word with understanding. Verse 29 to continue. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. In other words, they told him, you, you get out of town and stop teaching this Jesus Christ here. We don't want any part of this in here. Teaching the resurrection when the Sadducees believe that you live in the flesh, when you die, you go in the ground, that's it. There is no life after death. There... And the chief priest happens to be a Sadducee. Um, they're upset about it. But if you're going to teach, do it boldly. Don't, 
don't be a mealy mouth um, uh, sympathizer with the ways of the world. Teach God's word straight on as it is written emphatically when emphasis is necessary and soft when softness is necessary to carry forth the thought from the manuscripts. And our Father is so good to us that he allows us to boldly take forth his word. Verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Uh, and so it is, and that is our prayer today, and that's as it is. You, why do you do it in his name? That gives credentials that you're a believer. If you don't ask it in his name, how does our Father know you're a believer? He won't answer. <clears throat> so, um, how precious it is that um, our Father brings this truth to us. Uh, and this truth flows. And do you know, many people don't understand why you can speak with boldness. We, we are blessed to live in a nation that as long as you follow the laws of the land, you are guaranteed the right to have public ask, access to airways to teach that truth. And our nation protects you in teaching it. It's, it's a blessing from God. God blesses America. And we are very fortunate that we can take that signal around the world. But then you've still got the little knuckleheads out in the boonies that are trying to get themselves bumped off and locked up. Ignorance is bliss. And boy, do some people show it. You can be wise, be successful and teach God's word around the world. So, boldly. That's what's important. You know, in, in, um, in Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 10, it stipulates there, you know, if you don't think God's in control, it stipulates in Matthew 18, 10, that if you are one of God's elect, I'm not talking about people that just claim to be, if you are one of God's elect, your angel in heaven has the face of God at any time he chooses. Which means anytime you get in trouble, your angel in heaven has God's attention to call his attention to it so he can pull you out. Therefore, bringing to fulfillment the great scripture of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where God says there's nothing going to happen to you that isn't common with all men. And I will never tempt you with more than you can handle. He just knows some of us can handle a lot more than others. And he'll tempt, he'll allow it. But then we know, we that believe what he has said, he will never give more than we can handle and we can cut it. When, it, when it's too deep for anyone else to plow, turn us loose. Okay. We can handle it. And then he always states, and this is what makes it perfect, I will always show you a way out. So our Father is so very, very good to us that you can afford to be bold in his word as long as you're smarter than the serpent. If you're not smarter than the serpent, hey, bye. See you later. You'll be gone. Okay, so here we go then. That angel having the face of God is so perfect. The Holy Spirit always takes care of its own. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, always leave Father in the equation. You leave him out, I'm sorry, you're through. And place was, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spake the word of God with boldness. I don't mean a bunch of wimps wading around trying to play big. I'm talking about boldly teaching the God's word where it could be heard. They were told, hey, you know, the, back, in, um, back in verse uh, 19, I think it was, you know, where they 
they said, don't, don't, don't be teaching this Jesus. That didn't stop them. All the more boldly they brought it forth, that word of God. And so it is. Uh, always, uh, there is, you know, some people, how can you speak boldly by knowing what you're talking about? You know, if you don't really know what you're talking about, sometimes it's better if you zip this. Don't put this in motion until you got it up here. And some people may take that as arrogance. It isn't. It's knowledge. It's wisdom. It's God's blessings in boldness. Why? It gets the job done. It's successful. It is success with the blessings of the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit is God's Spirit. 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that ought of the uh, things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. In other words, all talents, all teaching, everything was common. Why? It was of one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. What is the resurrection? It's life. It's defeating death. And this is why the, the Sadducees were so very upset. Pharisees believe in life after death. All right? Does you a little good to be familiar with all religions to a point, so that at least you know where they're coming from. Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands and or houses sold them and bought the price, bought the, brought the prices of the things that were sold. In other words, when, when they were committed to the Word of God. In that time, there was no television, there was no newspapers to further the work. You had to get out there and hoof it. You had to get out and spread the word. They were never going to be back in the same place because you couldn't jump an airline and fly back home each night or have your own plane and fly back each night. You, you had to be a traveling evangelist or teacher. So they shared things in common and then God doesn't send out beggars. And so it is. Verse 35. And... Um, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distributing distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Verse 36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. They nicknamed him Barney the Preacher. Okay, it would be probably better translated. He was of the priest line. He was a Levite. Uh, 37. Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We're going into a chapter which to me kind of lets you have a little precursor, a look at the unpardonable sin. Meaning, don't ever lie to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and what you have is yours. You don't have to make any promises to God. You control what you have. But if you ever give your word to God about something, and I'm talking about to the true Father, keep it. Now, I, I want to say one other word. There are many people on fixed incomes that you have certain beggars that will beg for people on fixed incomes to make vows and 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 promise monies to certain ministries and they go without food sometime to pay that vow. Well, let me tell you, let me let me ease your heart a little bit. That wasn't a vow made to God. You you made a vow to a beggar because God's servants, God's true servants will never beg. Anytime you see someone begging for money or telling you to send seed money, they're a beggar and God didn't send them. Well, are you judging? No, it's just a fact, okay? It's written. So, don't, don't, if, you know, you don't have to keep that because you're not sharing that or you didn't, that vow to God, you made that vow to a rip-off artist. So, don't feel you have to do without to pay 
that so-called vow. So that's what this chapter is about. Be careful, my friend. I suppose the real bottom line is, is don't leave God out of the equation of your life. Don't leave the Holy Spirit out of the equation of your life. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, that's to say, whom Yahweh has graciously given. What a beautiful name. And Sapphire, Sapphire, Sapphire uh, his wife, that means tall, fair, and beautiful, dandy, sold a possession. They sold it. It was theirs, honest, straightforward, too, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I, I want to explain this. They promised it all. But if they knew that God, the Holy Spirit, even knows what you're thinking, they wouldn't try to con him. They did not have to promise at all, but they did. So they're about to lie or refuse the Holy Spirit, and that's what I want to get to. It's very dangerous to refuse the Holy Spirit. All right? And we're not, when it comes to God's elect, the unpardonable sin has nothing to do with gifts or money. It has to do with your ability, whether you can cut it or not. That's to say, stand against the false one. That's the unpardonable sin. What did Peter say? Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now listen carefully, verse 4, whilst it remained, when you owned it totally, was it not thine own question? It was yours for you to do with as you felt free. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? It was all yours. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men but unto God. So you, you, my point is this, don't you ever leave God out of the equation of your thought, your plans, your purpose. Uh, naturally, I'm taking this to the extreme of the unpardonable sin, but this generation is going to face that unpardonable sin, do or die, okay? You're gonna have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you're delivered up before the false Messiah. Never try to con God. It won't work. Okay. Verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Great fear came on all them that heard these things. It, he died dead in a hammer. Okay. I mean, God is the God of life and the God of... He can pull that any... He can bring it home anytime he wishes. 6, and the young men arose, wound him up in, a, in a, probably a sheet in his own clothes, carried him out and buried him. I mean, put him right away, give him a nice funeral. Uh, seven. And it was about the space of three hours after uh, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. I, I think it's important that you know what three hours is. Three hours is a watch. And you're all watchmen, as these were watchmen. Okay. And, you know, to a military man, a watch is a very, very serious thing. You know why? But you're the watchman while your buddies are sleeping. Okay. They, they expect you to be on guard that if an enemy comes, you can wake them up and get, get them in fighting order before the enemy attacks. And so it is when Satan lurks, if you're on watch, that three-hour watch, you make sure that nothing happens that it isn't reported, okay, to those that have concern. But here she comes. Uh, uh, the thing is, the lesson I want you to learn from this chapter is keep God in the equa equation of your life. That's the lesson. Verse four, 8. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much, question. He already knows, okay. And she said, yea, for so much. She gave him a false price, whatever it was that her and her husband had cooked up. Nine. Then Peter said unto her, 
How is it that ye have agreed together, you and your husband agreed together, to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Do you know who the Spirit of the Lord is? Have you ever wanted proof? It's the Holy Spirit. You want to know what the Holy Spirit is? It's the Spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Don't ever try to con God. 10. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. So uh, there she was. She was put in that earth. Naturally, her spirit returned to the Father. Again, I, I, I want to say to those on fixed incomes, don't ever read these scriptures and get on a guilt trip thinking you might have made a vow to a beggar because God doesn't send out beggars. Anybody that begs for money is not from God and you don't have to honor that vow. Honor it to God, not to a beggar, not to a rip-off artist, okay? I'm just winning friends and influencing people, okay? This is, this is what makes me so popular among uh, most Christian television. All right, just, I mean, you know, they just love me, love me, love me. Sweetest man on television. But I'm a teacher of truth, and I don't like to see senior citizens do without food and medicine because of some rip-off artist that's trying to take advantage of their eternal life, period. Verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. This reverence of God that um, you can't con our Father. And if you give your word, you know, if you give your word to our Father, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, it's a pretty good idea to keep it, okay? But sometimes God would say, it's better if you don't even make a vow. Just do what you're supposed to do. That's sufficient. Verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Do you know, do you know why they were at Solomon's porch? Because the non-believers could come that far. That wasn't going into the temple and they could be converted. Now, did you, how sharp are you? Okay. God's kind of playing with you a little bit here. I want to warn you beforehand. We just got through talking about the Lord's Spirit. Don't leave that out of the equation of your life. These two kind of lied to the Spirit. They're both out here pushing up daisies. Okay. What did that last verse say? And the hands of the apostles were signs, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Do you think they really did it? They didn't. You see, God did. They did it in Christ's name. They spoke it, but God accomplished it. Do you want to be successful? Then don't leave God out of the equation of your prayers, your requests. And you can do wonders if it's God's will. And if you're a true believer and are worthy of, of uh, asking in that name. But you see, it doesn't say here the Holy Spirit did it. You're supposed to know that. That's why there's a little pop test our Father is giving us in this chapter. Verse 13. And of the rest does no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. In other words, man, after those two bit the dust, there are not too many volunteers coming up saying, I'd like to join that group. Uh, you know, they're kicking the bucket right and left here. No, no, thank you all the same. That They marveled at the wonders and the signs, but they were a little careful about joining in. 14, and believers were the more, because they did and were magnified, Believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. Don't ever leave women out of the equation either. They are servants of the living God. And I will guarantee you as a pastor of way over 50 years, 
when it comes to church duties and work, there are more women workers than there are men. There are more women doing God's work than men. Men are lazy. No good, most of them. Absolutely, you couldn't get them to do God's work if you begged. And I'm not a beggar. I would never beg anyone to do anything. But it was the same way with Paul. If you understood Greek, when he's sending a letter of salutation, do you realize that most of them are women's names, feminine? So, you see, God helped the men that tries to put women down when they do most of the work in the church. I'm so very happy for them, with them, and about them. And, well, brother so-and-so is a man, and he really pre yeah, preaches against women most of the time, too, doesn't he? That's about, that's way over 50%. You know, I'll just say a word or two about this. In the old days, when Israel had no leader, who came forth? Deborah. She, she was a judge, the only judge in Israel at that time. And she told the men, you attacked. She said, oh, no. No way, Deborah. Not unless you're out in front of us. She said, well, get that wagon around here. She loaded up, and here she went. They followed. They had the victory. A woman led them. And, and just to, to, for God to add a little salt in the wound, J.L. wasn't even an Israelite woman. Killed the enemy. Said, come on, honey, in my tent and have a little sweet buttermilk. Okay. Come on in. And he came in, had a little buttermilk, and she drove a tent peg right square through his head. Okay. Women did it. So you want to be real careful when you start. And, and when it says, who witnesses against the Antichrist, written in the Joel the prophet, and back in Acts chapter 2, both sons and daughters. So be very careful. Okay, with respect to the church and to human beings in teaching God's word and in serving God. There are many good men and there are many good women. But the proof is in the pudding. All you got to do is look, just look sometime and see who does all the work and then, then report back to me. Verse 15. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Now, you see, there's kind of another test. Do you believe that Peter's shadow would heal someone? I hope you said no. Hope you said no. Peter, in looking upon them, just as Peter and John had looked upon that man at the beginning of this uh, ordeal, 40 years old or older, lame from the mother's womb, they looked upon him and asked the Holy Spirit to touch him and the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, touched him. And up he came, strengthened those ankles, those leg muscles, and he danced with joy. So, no, Peter's shadow. A lot of people get religion started out of stuff like this. Send me a hanky. Send me a little hanky and I'll bless it for you. And you know, hey, don't waste your time. If the Lord doesn't bless it, that man that said he'd bless it ain't going to help you a bit. Don't leave your father out of the equation. That's the lesson in this chapter. Peter knew that. I'm not belittling Peter and I'm not belittling John. They knew it. And that's why they were so successful. Do you know it? 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed, every, every one. Again, I'll ask you, who did it? Now, I, I, there is a very important bit of knowledge here. I want you to know that disease and vex spirits are separate. They are totally two different things. And if you ever expect to be a successful minister of God's word, you better know that. 
then you better know what you're up against. You'd better know how to deal with it. You are taught how in the God's word. But again, here every one of them healed. They brought them to those apostles and the apostles healed them. No, they did not. Again, I want to remind you, Christ healed them through the apostles. Again, not taking anything away from them, but they would want it taught exactly as it's supposed to be. I want you to know why those two people are dead that started this. Don't leave God out of the equation. It's a bad habit to get into, especially in this generation when the Holy Spirit wants to use you. Verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, uh-oh, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, no life after death, got it? And were filled with indignation. They were so jealous they couldn't hardly stand it. I mean, here, they've got a church down here on the corner. I mean, it's open for business. We sell doves. We expect people to, you know, we, we've got money changers right there, you know, to tear up your whatever. You know, it's like a 7 Eleven, quick and go, stop and go. Okay. We got it. And we can't do healings like this, but these people are making us jealous because they can do it. We got to get rid of them. 18. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison, threw them in jail. Nothing wrong with being in jail for serving God. A lot wrong with being in jail because you're a crook, okay? Or because you're not too bright. <clears throat> Don't know how to pay your taxes and a few other things. Dumber than the serpent. Guess where that'll end you? It doesn't take a brilliant, you don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to figure that one out or the brightest bulb in the ceiling, okay? You know, after all, who, who was the tax collector in, in Babylon? Daniel was, a servant of God. Why? He had it up here. He took over. He was next to the king. He was a ruler. God expects his elect to be smarter than that serpent. Well, what can you expect from the muckety ducks downtown? Jail time. They're not going to help you. They're going to be against you. But you're going to find out in the next lecture, God let them out. They didn't stay there. God just opened that prison right up. Holy Spirit did. Why? Again, to remind you, don't leave God out of the equation. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD 